So now, we, our goal in this video is to find the expected value of x for such a wave function. So we found that in the last video that the wave function is going to look something like this. So in order to find the expected value of x, we're going to have to evaluate this integral. So we need to take the absolute value square of the wave function. So this is the probability density function of the position x at time t, and then we multiply this by x, and then we integrate this dx. So all we have to do in this video is to evaluate this integral. So the first thing we're going to do is that we're going to try to find what the absolute value square of the wave function is. So the absolute value square of the wave function is the wave function multiplied by its conjugate. So I'm just going to combine some of the terms first. So if you take the uh, uh, conjugate of this term and you multiply it by itself, uh, the constants at the front, they come together to give you 9 over 10. If you take the conjugate and multiply xi of 1 with itself, you get the absolute value of xi of 1 squared. And if you take the conjugate of this term, you have a negative, uh, negative i in the exponent. And if you take the conjugate, you get a positive i, and those two terms will cancel out. So when you're squaring this term, this term will turn into something like this. And then the same goes for this other term. So you get 1 over 10 xi of 3, the absolute value is squared. And then this term will go away because it will cancel out with its conjugate. And then there are also the cross terms. So we considered the square of this term and the square of this term. But then as you know, if you're multiplying uh, like a polynomial uh, with brackets, you will also have the cross terms like a times y, x times b. So you also have the cross terms where xi1 will multiply with uh, xi3. So what you're going to get is that, first of all, the constants, they come together. So you get negative 3 over 10. And inside the bracket, we're going to get First of all, the conjugate of this term, so the conjugate of xi1 and the conjugate of this e term, multiplied with this term, so xi3 e to the power of negative i e3 t divided by h bar. And the second cross term is going to be the conjugate of this term multiplied by this term. So you're going to get the conjugate of xi3 multiplied by e to the power of i e3 t divided by h bar, multiplied by this term. And so this is going to be your absolute value square of the wave function. So recall that all that I did over here is just to evaluate the conjugate of the wave function multiplied by the wave function itself. And this is what you get. So of course we can simplify this a bit. So I'm just going to retain these terms. So you have this xi1 squared. And then you also have 1 over 10 psi 3 squared. And over here, uh, you, you can see that psi 1 and psi 3, both of these terms are, these terms are actually uh, completely real. There are no imaginary terms over here. So the conjugate doesn't really affect it much. Uh, it doesn't really affect it at all. So I'm just going to pull out psi 1 psi 3 out in the bracket, outside of the bracket. So I have psi 1 psi 3 outside of the bracket. And then inside the bracket, we're going to get e to the power of i e1 minus e3 times t divided by h bar. And then we have something similar for this other term, but this time it's e3, this time it's e3 minus e1. And then times t divided by h bar. So now I'm going to use Euler's formula. So I'm going to use the fact that e to the power of i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. So what I'm going to do is that and I'm going to express this e term as cosine e1 minus e3 divided by h bar t plus i sine e1 minus e3 divided by h bar t. And then I'm going to do the same for this term. So you have this term plus this term uh, expressed using all this formula. So I have e3 minus e1, but inside the cosine term, it doesn't really matter what your sine is. So I'm just going to change it to e1 minus e3 as well. So originally it's e3 minus e1, but it doesn't matter inside a cosine, a cosine term, so I'm just going to switch the e3 minus e1 to a e1 minus e3. And then here I'm going to do the same for the sine term. So I have minus i sine uh, e1 minus e3. So once again, originally it was e3 minus e1, but then I'm going to switch the sine inside the bracket. But then for the sine term, I need to cancel out that uh, negative term that I introduced on the inside. So there's this the positive over here is going to turn to, into a minus. 
So by changing this to e1 minus e3, I've also introduced a negative sign in front of the i term. And you can see that both of these will cancel out. And then here you have two of these cosine terms. So instead of writing this out as two separate terms, I have two times cosine. So in the end, you can see that your absolute value square of your wave function is going to be equal to 9 over 10 xi1 squared plus 1 over 10 xi3 squared and then plus this cosine term over here so minus 3 over 10 xi1 psi 3 and then you have your cosine term so cosine e1 minus e3 divided by h bar t so remember, all we're trying to do is to find the absolute va the expected value of x. So now we're ready to find the expected value of x because the integral that we are dealing with is the expected va is x multiplied by the absolute value square of the wave function. So by substituting this term inside, you see that we have a nine over ten, so zero to a x times xi one square dx plus one over ten. 0 to a x xi3 squared dx and then plus so I've ran out of space so I'm just going to continue here so plus uh, you have actually it should be a minus 3 over 10 with a cosine e1 minus e3 divided by h bar t and then you will have 0 to a x times xi1 xi3 dx so this is what your integral is going to be and then if you'll recall that from uh, one of the earlier questions on the infinite square well, you know that the expected value of x for stationary state is actually equal to a over 2. So both of these integrals over here will actually be equal to a over 2. So this is just the expected value of x for the first stationary state. This is just the expected value of x for the third stationary state. And then we found that in the earlier sections in the book, in one of the questions, we found that uh, this expected value both of these expected values should be equal to a over 2. So in the end, you can see that the expected value of x is actually equal to 9 over 10 times a over 2, and then 1 over 10 times a over 2, and then plus this integral over here. So let's just call this term i, so plus i, because I'm just not going to write this out again. So this is what our expected value of x is. And of course, you can combine this Together you have 9 over 10, 1 over 10, so in the end you have a over 2 plus i. So all that remains now is for us to evaluate this term over here. And that would give us the value of i, which would give us the expected value of x. So you can see that all we have to do is to evaluate this term over here. So that, that's what we're going to focus on now. We're going to try to evaluate this integral. So uh, turning our focus on this integral, we have 0 to a, x, xi1 psi 3 dx. And then I'm going to substitute in the expressions for xi1 and psi 3. Uh, they both have a normalizing constant of square root of 2 over a, so I'm just going to pull that out. They both combine together to give you 2 over a. And then inside the integral we have sine n pi x over a. So for the first station we say it should be 1 pi x over a. So pi x over a. And then for xi 3 it should be sine 3 pi x over a dx. So this is the integral that we that we want to deal with. So in order to evaluate this integral, we're going to use the product to sum formula. So the product to sum formula tells us that sine a times sine b is actually equal to one half cosine a minus b minus cosine a plus b. So you can look this up if you don't remember this. So using this formula, I can convert this sine term into uh, two cosine terms. So I'll have a 1 half, and then this term here will be the a, this would be the b. So cosine a minus b, that's cosine negative 2 pi x over a. And once again, inside a cosine term, we don't care about the sign, so I can just change this to positive 2 pi x over a. And then for this other term here, we have minus cosine a plus b. So we have cosine 4 pi x over a, and then dx. So in the end, this, these cancel out. So in the end, you see that we have an integral of x times cosine 2 pi x over a, and we have an integral of x times cosine 4 pi x over a. So both of these integrals, they pretty much take out the same form. So in the end, 
And so if we have to evaluate both of these expressions, if we want to integrate both of these expressions, all we're doing is that we're integrating from 0 to a x times cosine 2n pi x over a dx. So you can see that for this first term over here, this will correspond to the case when n is equal to 1. For this 4 pi x, this will correspond to the case when n is equal to 2. So I'm just solving for the general case. So once I solve this integral, I can just substitute my results back here. So now we're going to shift our focus to solving this integral. So we can solve this by uh, using integration by parts. So we're going to retain this term, and then we're going to integrate this. So integrating the cosine term, this gives us sine 2n pi x over a, and then we need to flip the constants. And this will be evaluated from 0 to a. And then we minus from 0 to a, and now we differentiate the x term, which becomes 1. So in the end, we have a over 2n pi times sine 2n pi x over a dx. And you can see that when you substitute in a, you get sine 2n pi, which is just equal to 0. When you substitute 0, you get 0 times sine 0, which is also 0. So this whole term is equal to 0. So all we have to deal with is this integral over here. So let's pull out the constants. And then integrating the, the sine term, we get negative cosine. So 2n pi x over a. And then once again, we flip the constants. So I'm just going to combine it with these constants here. And then we're also going to take away that negative sign. And this will be evaluated from 0 to a. And then you can see that when I substitute in a here, I get cosine 2n pi. And then when I substitute 0, I get minus cosine 0, which is just equal to 1. And the cosine 2n pi n is actually an integer, right? In our case, in our cases that we're dealing with here, n is specifically equal to 2 and 4. And then for both of these cases, uh, for, and for all other cases where n is an integer, this term would actually be equal to 1. So you get 1 minus 1, which is equal to 0. So that means this entire integral here is actually equal to 0. So what that means is that for this term over here, this integral that we're actually interested in, what you're going to get is actually 1 over a times uh, the integral of x times cosine 2 pi x over a, which is equal to 0, minus the integral of x times cosine 4 pi x over a, which is also equal to 0. So this whole integral is equal to 0. So that means this integral is equal to 0. So going back, that means this integral is equal to 0. That means this entire term is equal to 0. So this i here, which I've used to represent this term, is actually equal to 0. So in the end, the expected value of x is actually just equal to a over 2.